Today we're going to be talking about nutrient therapy for effective treatment in ADHD, autism, behavioral disorders, learning disabilities. Um, and in actuality, the stuff that I'm going to be talking about for this could be extrapolated out to really just about all mental health. So whether we're looking at things with anxiety, depression, whether we're working with people with schizophrenia, bipolar, it's just that there's going to be um, different prevalence for different groups, okay, as far as what the dysfunctions are going on. When I look at mental health, and some of this is going to be familiar to anybody that was here for the anxiety depression lecture, but we're going to focus it more around behavior, ADHD, autism. When I look at mental health as a whole, there's many pieces to mental health. And so what we're going to be talking about today is going to be the advanced nutrient therapy approach that I look at to mental health, which is very targeted, specific nutrients to balance out any kind of um, biochemical imbalance that's going on in the system. And we're going to get into lots of detail around all of this. But just so that you're aware of it, when we look at um, ADHD, autism, behavior, learning, self-regulation is another big piece to look at. Um, one of my favorite experts in this area is Dr. Stuart Shanker, who's out of York University. And he's done a lot of work with self-regulation, and that's really looking at how well we can balance between our fight or flight nervous system and then back into our rest and digest part of our nervous system. And essentially, if we are in fight or flight, it makes it very difficult to access this prefrontal cortex part of our brain, which is where we actually make good decisions from. We can function, we can focus, we can basically make decisions that are in our higher good. And when we're in fight or flight, that part gets really turned off, okay? And when you're looking at kids particularly, they're not even wired here, really until you kind of get into your early 20s for the most part. So, um, my wife and I think about this all the time when our 12-year-old can drive us a little bit crazy at times. I have to kind of remember, he doesn't really have a completely functioning uh, wired prefrontal cortex, so he can't really think beyond that as well as maybe we can. And then I think about how difficult I might even be having to try and balance stuff, and I can actually function better with that. So it's a good indication when your kids drive you crazy and you're having a hard time regulating to think how much harder it probably is for them because at least we're wired to be able to do it. And this actually gets into a whole bunch of other information um, in self-regulation we look at that we actually um, become sort of the prefrontal cortex for our kids. So that our kids very much respond by this interbrain connection they will react very much to where we're at. So if we are in fight or flight, then it's you know, almost impossible for that child to be um, back into rest and digest. I'm going to probably at some point break all of these down and do talks on each one of them because they're all super important. So we'll get into that one more at another time. The other one I look at is mind, body, spirit. So this would be looking at everything from cognitive behavioral therapy to spirituality, to mindfulness training, things like yoga, martial arts. There's a whole lot of stuff that goes into this. And then we look at gut health and nutrition. And what we know now is that the way that gut health is plays a huge role in how we react to our environment. There's different bacteria that basically can make us feel angry. There's bacteria that make us feel happy. There's bacteria that can make us feel sad. And depending on which bacteria we're nourishing will directly impact how we're feeling. And then basic nutrition, so things like regulating blood sugar levels, hugely important. Um, if any of you have kids and they're, they have skipped meals or they're not managing blood sugar well or if they've had foods that are creating a spike and a crash in blood sugar, uh, you know, as much as sometimes they say sugar does not make a difference with hyperactivity, I, anybody who has kids knows that it does yeah. and you will see it very prominently. So, and in general, some of the different experts would say that blood sugar will basically trump almost everything because it will throw them on a bit of a roller coaster ride for neurotransmitters. But in my mind, when we start with the advanced nutrient therapy, if there is something going on in this area, if there's a biochemical imbalance, in my mind, it is a rate limiting step on how far someone's going to get. If there are certain things where they are just not able to make neurotransmitters or 
interfere with the reuptake of neurotransmitters, you're just going to be stuck. So even if you're doing mindfulness behavior, I think of it like this. If I had a biochemical imbalance that was altering my neurotransmitters, and I'll get into all of this in more detail when we go through each one, and someone said, Jason, go sit down and start meditating. It would almost be sometimes um, in my body, it might feel like I just finished drinking six cups of coffee, and then someone went and told me to sit down mm -hmm. and do cognitive behavioral therapy or to be mindful. And it's like my body would just be physically restless. And so to me, if that stuff is going on, even if you can get some benefit from doing cognitive behavioral therapy or mindfulness, which I'm a big fan of, but if you've got this underlying biochemistry, I think you're going to be limited on just how much benefit you can get from it. The bulk of the work that I'm going to be speaking about is going to be based on the Walsh Research Institute. The Walsh Research Institute is a nonprofit public charity. It's based out of Chicago. I was there for a training last year, and I was blown away by what they came up with. And they basically, Dr. Walsh has been working in this field for about 40 years. And he was working a lot with a renowned um, psychiatrist named Dr. Uh, Pfeiffer. And he was a PhD researcher, psychiatrist, brilliant guy, one of the founders of orthomolecular nutrition. And he did a lot of uh, founding work in mental health, all of these areas from autism to bipolar to Alzheimer's. And they run an international physician training now. So when I was there, there was doctors from literally all over the world that was there. And it was really fascinating because there was a handful of us that were naturopathic physicians. And most of them were actually psychiatrists. Some of them were um, internal med doctors. Some of them were pediatricians. So it was really neat to see uh, such a diverse group there that was all wanting to figure out nutritional therapy. Dr. Welsh originally started working in the prison system. And so he did a lot of work with um, prisoners. And what he found was that he would start treating prisoners for violence in prison. And he would find that when they were treated, their violent behavior would start to calm back down. And over the years, what he found was that running specific tests, he would be able to basically tell within about 90% accuracy just by looking at the blood work if that was a violent criminal or a nonviolent criminal. The blood work and the urine chemistry would keep showing certain patterns. And so once he kind of realized this, he said, you know, we need to start working with kids because a lot of these prisoners were just kids with bad biochemistry that then got put on a certain life trajectory. So it was really neat. When we were there, the vast majority of the time was just seeing cases, patient after patient after patient. These poor patients that would come in with 75 doctors on this massive table, sitting there going through their whole thing, being asked all these questions. But I think they also loved it because it was a lot of focused attention. And um, you'd see beginning patients, you'd see patients that had come back for their third follow-up. And a lot of the times you would see that as blood and urine chemistry changed, symptoms would change along with it. And what I loved about it too is it was, it was very reproducible. You would expect to see certain things when you treated it accordingly. So Walsh Research Institute, 10,000 behavior and ADHD patients that they've looked at. Uh, 3,500 schizophrenia and bipolar, 3,200 depression, anxiety, and 6,500 autism. And there's actually been many more than this, but this is where a lot of the clinical experiences come from. Um, they have a massive chemical database, laboratory testing of over 30,000 mental health patients and controls, with more than 3 million chemical assays, um, where they've looked at the biochemistry for a number of these different patients. What he found... What he found over the years was that with patients dealing with any kind of mental health concerns versus a quote-unquote normal population, they would constantly see striking changes in certain blood and urine chemistry. And the more he started to see this, then it started to get pulled together and you'd see trends in different conditions. So we all have this biochemical individuality. And this is why, for the most part, people need different levels of different nutrients. Some people have too many of certain nutrients, some people have too little. And either way, it's going to create problems if you've got too much or too little. Depending on your specific metabolism, you might need much higher levels of certain key nutrients than somebody else. Depending on what their environmental exposure has been, everybody's a little bit different. 
The good news is that really when you look at the hundreds of different types of nutrients that we look at, from vitamins and minerals and amino acids and polyphenols and all these different types of things, there's really less than a dozen that are, play a primary role when we look at mental health. And the reason is that these primary nutrients play key roles in the interaction that either the production or the reuptake of key neurotransmitters that govern how we think, feel, and act. Neurotransmitters, for the most part, which we'll go through in just a bit here, play a dominant role in how we feel at a moment-to-moment -moment basis. And when we look at initial lab testing, um, that's how we decide based on initial lab testing and a physical examination and a proper intake, then we can start to figure out what do we need to do specifically for these individuals. So some frequently asked questions. How can vitamins, minerals, or amino acids significantly help a person with a serious mental illness? I mean, don't you need a powerful drug to do that kind of a job? Well, the truth is, is that nutrients are extremely powerful. And what I love about nutrients is we often think that we need medications for things, and sometimes we do need medications. But you have to remember what nutrients are. For the most part, nutrients are cofactors to make different um, to make different reactions move from one step to the next step. If we don't have enough of them, then certain reactions just can't flow properly. And what they found specifically related to mental health is that nutrients play a huge role in the synthesis or the production of key neurotransmitters. They actually have an epigenetic regulation on gene expression. So epigenetics talks about how the environment can affect can in effect turn on or turn off different susceptibilities. So for example, you might be passed along a susceptibility, an epigenetic susceptibility for breast cancer, okay? But that may never be turned on and expressed if you do certain things environmentally. Or it might be very quickly turned on and expressed if you do other things that don't support it. Does that make sense? So nutrients are a very powerful epigenetic trigger, okay? They also impact on neurotransmitter reuptake processes. So when you think about neurotransmitters, there's really two sort of key things we're going to be talking about. You need to be able to make them, right? So we need the raw ingredients to make these things. And once we make them and they, they transfer from neuron to neuron, they have to sit in something called a synapse. Think of a synapse like a bucket. So you need to have enough that stays there to be able to have the appropriate response. Too much or too little can be a problem. So we need to focus on, can we make enough, and can we keep it there in the right amount once we do? And also nutrients play a huge role in the protection against oxidative stress, which the more we're finding, oxidative stress is a cornerstone for disease because it triggers inflammatory processes, which creates havoc on a lot of different systems in the body. So, we're going to break down some of the neurotransmitters. For anybody that's not too familiar with them, has anybody heard of any of these? Anybody heard of serotonin? It's probably a pretty common one. Probably we, when we have a piece of chocolate, probably we self-medicate by giving ourselves a little bit of a serotonin boost for a bit. We feel a little bit good, and then we might crash back down and not feel so good, so then we need more chocolate. Um, dopamine, GABA, norepinephrine, so we'll run through each one of these. The key thing I want to get across here is that you need to have the right balance, okay? Too much serotonin, dopamine, adrenaline, GABA, or too little of the same things will both create problems. We need to get things in a nice balanced state. So serotonin, we think of this as the happiness hormone or the happiness neurotransmitter. It helps us bring our mood up. It regulates anxiety to some point. Low levels have been generally associated with depression, and it plays a big role in sleep and wake cycles because it is part of the cascade that is necessary to make melatonin, okay? Dopamine. When I think of dopamine, I think of movement regulation because people that have Parkinson's have an imbalance in the brain where they can't make dopamine. And I also think of things with attention and focus, so ADHD, because most of the medications that patients with ADHD have try to raise dopamine to help kids focus a little bit better. But they also play a big role in addiction. 
So they're, they're a, one that we look at with addictions to anything from alcohol or drugs um, or even food addiction, sugar addiction. Uh, what they're actually finding more and more now is that even texting, emails, all of this sort of, this is actually creates a lot of dopamine addiction. And uh, I mean, you can see that. It's almost like, I feel like everybody's like junkies when they get a text and they're just waiting for it to come back. And if it doesn't come back right away, we're already starting to get kind of itchy a little bit. Um, and it also plays into pain processing. GABA. Has anybody used GABA or heard of GABA? Mm -hmm. GABAs are counteraction to adrenaline for the most part. GABA helps to just calm the nervous system down. This is sort of our benzodiazepines that people take when they've got a lot of anxiety and can't sleep. They might take something that kind of calms the body down a little bit and helps them drift off. They're also highly addictive though, so you don't want to get on them for too long. But what we ultimately want to do is can we restore normal levels of GABA ourselves? Norepinephrine, think of this as adrenaline. So this is the primary one that governs our fight or flight. It's our primary stress hormone. It increases arousal, so it helps us become more aware, awake, and focused. If it's too low, more into almost like an adrenal fatigue type of state, we might hit more fatigue, we're mentally foggy, we might feel depressed, we're low motivation, poor attention or focus. And then again, if it goes too high, we're going to be more anxiety, hyperactivity, even mania. Plays a vital role in memory, attention, and mental focus, but too much you start to get anxiety, too little you can get depression, it can create insomnia and emotional stability. So what was found from the Walsh Research Institute over all of these years of looking at this is that there were certain repeat offenders that would happen over and over and over again with most patients that had any kind of mental illness. What they found was that the tendency was that copper overload came up a lot, people with too much copper. Notoriously low levels of B6 and zinc were very common. Something called pyrrole disorder, which we will talk about specifically when we get to it. Methylation imbalances, which we will also talk about specifically once we get to it. And then fatty acid imbalances and toxic metal overload. So fatty acid imbalances, we're primarily looking at things like omega-3s versus omega-6s and arachidonic acid. Omegas, omega-3 and 6, they basically govern our inflammatory and anti-inflammatory production of, of um, prostaglandins. So if we are out of balance, we can create a very inflammatory environment in the body, which can affect a whole bunch of different things. And toxic metals, not as common, but um, that one does show up. All of these imbalances, remember when I said that there's less than a dozen that play a key role in governing how we think and feel and act playing in with mental health. These are kind of the big ones that we're going to look at. We're going to break these down. So in a database of over 5,600 ADHD cases and 1.5 million chemical assays from the Walsh Research Institute, they broke down three primary subtypes of ADHD. So they looked at predominantly inattentive, predominantly impulsive and hyperactive, and then a combined group. So the predominantly inattentive would show normal or high intelligence, but very poor focus and concentration. They were the ones that were described more as daydreamers. They had little interest in the subject matter and they, kind of, they would kind of get lost and be looking out the window type of a picture. Um, these kids did not have issues with behavior control and social, socialization. They actually did quite well with all of this. They were actually very good. But they still notoriously had poor academic status. When you look at the predominantly impulsive and hyperactive group, these were the ones that were constantly in motion. They were the ones, you know, checking with their friend. They couldn't sit still. They're moving around their chair. They have to get up and move around constantly. Very short attention span and highly distractible. These ones did very poorly academically, regardless of their level of intelligence. And the combined group, as you can imagine, this was the largest group, and this was the most severe academic underachievement, because they're working on two different things here. And these ones often had multiple biochemical imbalances. So when you're looking at these, it's not always just one or another. I've seen people that have had three different imbalances that all are actually treated slightly different. 
And so sometimes you have to pick and choose where do you start, or you start working on all of them at the same time, depending on which shows up maybe strongest. Okay, so the biochemistry for what they found for each of these groups, for the predominantly inattentive, over 50% of them were low in folic acid, B12, zinc, and choline. Um, developed better focus after they started to increase their levels through supplementation and normalize. These kids also had to make sure that they were challenged intellectually because a lot of this group tended to be higher IQ. <clears throat> The predominantly impulsive group in hyperactive. Classic copper overload with zinc deficiency. I actually see this one very commonly. Um, What's copper? What do you mean by that? Copper is a mineral. So these are different minerals. And we'll go through how they affect the body as we get through. Where did you get the copper? I'll go through that in just a bit. <clears throat> yeah, it's a good question. And a, a lot of times with this stuff is not necessarily that it's coming specifically from diet. It's possible. So, for example, the biggest place where you're going to get copper is from probably copper piping, copper pots, stuff like that. If that's the case, then I would remove it. But most of the time, it's not necessarily that you are ingesting lots of copper. It's that you can't get it out. So when you do accumulate it, you can't remove it very easily. And we'll talk about that in a little bit as to how we treat it. Um, this group, the predominantly impulsive and hyperactive, that had classically high copper and low zinc. We'll go through all of these in detail as we go along, giving a bit of an overview first, and then we'll, we'll touch in on each one of them. So what happens with this is that they were associated with low dopamine and elevated norepinephrine, norepinephrine being adrenaline. So they would end up naturally having low levels of dopamine, which means that's our ability to focus. That's our, remember, that's the primary one that ADHD medications try and tar tar target. So they've got lower dopamine and they end up with elevated adrenaline. So you've got to picture this child that now can't focus very well and they're also feeling revved up at the same time. Of course they're going to be fidgety. When you look at the combined group, um, we definitely have to do lab testing because there's often multiple things going on. And what they found here was 68% have seriously high copper to zinc ratios. And there was often other imbalances mixed there too, whether they had methylation issues, which we'll talk about, whether they had pyrroles, which we'll also talk about, or whether they had certain levels of heavy metals. So nature versus nurture. And this is why at the very beginning when I say when we're treating mental health, when we're treating kids with ADHD or autism or behavior learning disabilities, there is a combination of what is going on biochemically and what is happening in our environment. So what they did find is that in longitudinal studies, biochemical tendencies, if they are there, tend to persist throughout life. So which means if there is a significant biochemical imbalance, it needs to probably be treated regularly and probably for long term. Now, I always like to retest as we go along and make sure things are working and then see ultimately what do people need. Sometimes I think other things change and our requirements for certain nutrients change. It's always going to be changing. I mean, one thing we can guarantee is that life is not permanent. So whatever we currently do is likely going to change at some point. That also happens with our biochemical imbalances. So even though this tends to show it happens throughout life, I find a lot of times people might need to be very strict on things initially and then you see what needs to change. Sometimes if enough stuff changes in the environment, you might be able to alter your requirements for different nutrients too. For example, um, the impact on one's life depends on the severity of the imbalance and the environmental factors. If you had an ADHD tendency child, they might develop totally normally if they have a nurturing family, they have a healthy diet, they exercise, and there's been no real traumatic incidents to trigger things, right? But at the same point, that same child, if they had a lot of traumatic incidents early on, if they have a horrible diet, if they don't move their body, if they um, are in a poor family household that's not very loving, that's, those tendencies are probably going to be turned on and then amplified. If you have a severe chemical imbalance, 
how Dr. Welsh said in his book is that a severe biochemical imbalance cannot be loved away. Meaning, if there's something going on, it needs to be addressed because you are going to be kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. It needs to be corrected. And then I think once that happens, you open up a whole new world of possibilities. Then maybe all of the other therapies that have been tried all of a sudden start to have bigger effects. Recipe for bad behavior is a biochemical predisposition plus a flawed environment. And it's why we look at all of it. In an outcome study um, for behavioral disorders, we looked at 207 patients with behavioral disorders, 149 male, 58 female. This is through the Walsh Research Institute. Um, these patients were diagnosed and treated conventionally, and frequency of physical assaults and destructive episodes were determined before and after treatment up to four to eight months later. Prior diagnosis, they had oppositional defiant disorder, antisocial personality disorder, and ADHD. More than 95% of them had already been treated with um, behavioral modification, conflict resolution therapy, counseling, psychotherapy, prior to seeking nutrient therapy. 85% of them had already been on medications like Ritalin, antidepressants, or other psychiatric meds. And in all cases, they still had serious behavioral problems. This is what they found. The most common imbalances within this group, elevated copper to zinc ratio in 75.4% of these kids, created low dopamine and high levels of adrenaline. This would create episodic rage, um, ADD, and hyperactivity. They found overmethylation. We'll talk about these and what they mean in a little bit. 29.5%, this would create elevated dopamine and norepinephrine or adrenaline and it would relate to things like anxiety, paranoia, and depression. Undermethylation, 37.7%, often with low levels of serotonin, and often low levels of dopamine as well. And they would have more symptoms like depression, obsessive compulsive tendencies, seasonal allergies. 32.9% of them had pyrrole disorder, which would create dramatically low levels of serotonin and dopamine, and would create very poor stress control, explosive periods of anger, um, you'd often see huge ups and down swings that can happen with these kids. Uh, glucose discontrol, usually more on the low blood sugar side. And what they found was this was not usually a cause for the behavior, but it was a huge aggravating factor for behavior. So regulating blood sugar, I definitely think, is a really important one as a standard for all, really not just kids, for everybody. The more the parents have good blood sugar control, the better they're going to be able to parent their kids, too. If you're both going on swings, have fun. Um, heavy metal overload was about 70.9% and malabsorption was 15.5%. Treatment. So what they found was that after going through the nutrient therapy, 15% of this population were symptom free. They found about 33% partial improvement, 8% no change, and 1% got worse. Those are pretty great results if you're not familiar with how these things work. It would be hard to find too many medications that I think have that degree of success. So how nutrients affect neurotransmitters? Just to recap, they affect the production of neurotransmitters. They can cause an increase in the conversion of one neurotransmitter to another. Or they can also increase or decrease the production of something called transporter proteins that lead to either too much or too little. And I'll go through a diagram on what that looks like in a bit. So when we actually look at how these things play together, when we are making, let's look at the production of neurotransmitters. When we are trying to make neurotransmitters, we have to have certain nutrients in order to do it. So the first thing you need to have is you have to have enough um, of the raw ingredients. So the raw ingredient for, say, serotonin to make that would be an amino acid called tryptophan. So first off, you would need to have enough tryptophan. In order to have enough tryptophan means you have to be able to digest properly and break down proteins so we can even get tryptophan from foods. So we have to have a decent diet to get enough protein, adequate forms of protein, and we have to make sure that we're digesting well enough that we can break those down into amino acids so that our body can use it as building blocks. 
Once we've got enough, then we have to make sure that we've got enough of the cofactors, which are all either vitamins or minerals for the most part, to make sure that that can be eventually formed into the neurotransmitter. They usually have to go through multiple stages of cofactors. So in order to make serotonin, for example, the last stage goes from something called 5-hydroxytryptophan, or 5-HTP, you might have heard, to serotonin. In order for that to work, this enzyme, called this decarboxylase enzyme, has an absolute requirement for B6 and zinc to work properly. If you do not have enough B6 and zinc, you are going to have a heck of a time trying to convert 5-HTP to serotonin. And when we go down the road here, we look at dopamine, they have a decarboxylase enzyme too. And guess what? They also need B6 and zinc. If you do not have enough B6 and zinc, you will have a very difficult time making enough dopamine. GABA, same thing, requires B6 and zinc. If you do not have enough B6 and zinc, you will not be able to make enough GABA. So let's take a look at these two nutrients. So B6 deficiency, hugely significant nutrient in the synthesis of almost every brain neurotransmitter that governs mood and behavior. It's a powerful promoter of that decarboxylase enzyme that's needed to make serotonin, dopamine, and GABA. And it is chronically deficient in many people with an array of mental health concerns. We use several different forms, so for the most part, when we're treating this, we would use B6, and then often we need to use an active form of B6. And patients tend to do better with a combination of the two for some reason. Um, the active form would be called something P5P or pyridoxal 5-phosphate, but you need to have specific amounts of this in much higher levels than what you would normally be required if you did not show the need for it. So excessively high levels of B6 is not safe for a normal population. It could actually create um, neurological problems like a B12 deficiency almost if you took too much and you did not need it, which is why it's essential to be tested to make sure that you need it. And if you do, then you're taking high levels to try to balance out a mega deficient state. Um, also, it is very limited in our diet and depleted due to chronic inflammation and epigenetic imbalances. Part of the problem, too, nowadays is that it is difficult to get a lot of these nutrients in our diet. So, especially minerals. When we think about minerals, minerals come from soil. So if our soil is depleted, we are going to have a hard time getting enough nutrients. It's like, I think of it when people want to get, get iron from spinach. It's a great idea, but that's, that unless that is in very nutrient-dense soil, you, that spinach is not going to magically make a lot of iron. It has to be drawn from the soil. B6, has been very, B6 deficiency has been shown to be related to ADHD, depression, anxiety, insomnia, and sleep disorders, and irritability because it plays such a wide role in all of these neurotransmitters, and it can really put people on a loop for trying to feel quote-unquote normal. Mm -hmm. Zinc deficiency, one of the absolute most common nutrient deficiencies in the world. It is a cofactor in over 200 different enzymes that require zinc to function properly. That's important because this is what nutrients do. It's why when you are low in nutrients, you might not just have one symptom. You will have a wide array of symptoms because they play into so many different um, aspects of how we live, how our body functions. So, for example, like zinc, we know that it plays as a cofactor in all of these neurotransmitters that we just talked about, including melatonin, GABA, serotonin, glutamate. But also it plays a role in things like our immune system function. So it's not uncommon when we see super low levels of zinc that kids seem to get frequent infections. Uh, they might get ear infections. They might get colds that they have a hard time getting rid of. Maybe they've had poor growth and development. They're on the, the lower sort of uh, part of the radar in that and maybe they have delayed sexual development. All of those things can play into um, a zinc deficient state. What we test for, the optimal level is somewhere between 90 to 130. 
And I would say across the board, I rarely see people at 90 to 130. 76 is the common number for mental health concerns. And I've seen people as low as in the 50s. And the thing is that these nutrients are teeter-totter nutrients, meaning if you have zinc, you need to have a certain amount of copper. They have to be balanced. So even when you look at blood work, if your doctor ran certain things and they weren't aware of how these things have to interact with each other, they might say, oh no, your copper is in the right zone and your zinc seems to be in the right zone too. But if you're at the top of your range in copper and the bottom of your range in zinc, you've got a big imbalance going on. And optimal balances for these, for example, for copper to zinc should be about 0.8 to 1. They should be almost 1 to 1 ratio or slightly more zinc to copper. Anything outside of that creates problems. And this is why. When we look at dopamine, dopamine can be converted to adrenaline or to norepinephrine. So remember, dopamine is what helps us stay focused for the most part. It plays in with movement and tick disorders and things too. And norepinephrine or adrenaline is what sort of amps us up, right? It gets us excited. It's our fight or flight hormone. If you have a lot of free copper, so if there's a lot of copper floating around, it will catalyze this reaction and cause you to convert dopamine to norepinephrine or adrenaline. So when people have elevated copper, they are being pushed biochemically in the direction of lowering dopamine and increasing adrenaline. And so this is the example when I said, someone like this is also going to feel a little bit like this inside their body all the time because they're constantly being put into fight or flight. So if you were trying to do mindfulness training with somebody who's biochemically constantly going into fight or flight, I just think you're gonna hit roadblocks and you're not gonna go very far. If you were trying to get someone to do, I, I talked to a patient, I tested, and I, and I was talking, she's like, oh my gosh, she goes, that is exactly. She had spent years doing cognitive behavioral therapy, she does yoga, she does all these things. She says, I am aware from the cognitive behavioral therapy and the mindfulness training of kind of what I should do and kind of what is going on. But she goes, I still feel all the time like this. And I think that's a prime example of what can happen like this. When this stuff starts to get treated, I feel like what it does is it's almost it just dials down the intensity a bit so that then we can start to work with it a little bit more. Because I can guarantee you, if people have had imbalances for a long time, then what happens is we start, to, we start to feel a certain way. When we feel a certain way, we start to think a certain way. And then we start to act a certain way. And the world around us reacts to that. And then we create patterns. And then after a while, it's like that becomes our default. We just start to do things in a certain way. So once this stuff gets dialed down and calmed down, I think it's really important then to do some of the other work to work with things like belief structure, to do the mindfulness training, to try and slow things down and sort of realize that we can actually take different avenues. We can, we can react to these things maybe differently, right? And with kids with ADHD, for example, and not just kids, but adults, but most of the time we think about this with children, um, a lot of times these things are epigenetic, meaning they have often passed along generationally. So it's not uncommon that you will see a parent with something like this and the child might have something similar. And if they're both having issues with that, it just makes it really hard. So I think the more people kind of find stuff out and get balanced, it just makes life a little bit easier. So really common one with uh, mental illness of any sort can definitely predispose to psychiatric disorders. Nutrient therapy can assist in normalizing dopamine and noradrenaline levels. And some of these can take a while. It can, these aren't necessarily a super quick fix. Um, during the course, we were told, and we'll go through each one of them, because pyrroles can tend to get corrected a little bit faster. This one, depending on what's going on, sometimes takes a little bit longer. And I had a patient who had extremely high levels of copper and extreme depression and we have been treating for about four months and it was just not budging. And then I literally just got an email a while ago and she says the cloud like just started to lift for the first time in years. And so 
And even testing, it's like her copper was just not coming down. She was also going through um, perimenopause. And so that also is, seems to be an aggravating factor with copper, which we'll talk about in just a bit. So some of the symptoms of copper overload. Severe anxiety, sleep disorders, hormonal imbalances, hyperactivity in childhood. They also tend to have a lot of skin sensitivities to metals, uh, rough fabric. They don't like the feeling of tags and stuff like that. Um, not uncommon that you could get ringing in the ears and tinnitus. And very much related for women with estrogen intolerance. Copper has a tendency to react with estrogen. So with women, you will often see an aggravation. Not all the time, but very commonly you will see an aggravation with anything that's hormonally based. So whether um, when they go through puberty, when women go through puberty and they have their first period, um, during their cycle, postpartum, perimenopause, they will have aggravations. Because what happens, particularly with, say, um, postpartum depression, copper rises significantly during pregnancy because copper is essential for uh, neurodevelopment in the child. But what happens is that if they have an epigenetic imbalance where they can't get rid of it, then they end up with very elevated levels of copper, which now can't come back down. I had a patient a while ago that was just talking about how a lot of her symptoms really came after childbirth and checked her copper. And for example, optimal zone for free copper should be about 10%. No more than 25% at the high end. Her copper was about 44%. So huge trigger pushing her in that direction. I just don't think she, ever, she didn't have the, the physiology to be able to get rid of it. And so she had a huge amount of copper, very low amount of zinc. And so now we're just starting to kind of work on tapering that down. You also see um, learning disabilities, white spots on the fingernails, usually because it's associated with a very low level of zinc too. Emotional meltdowns, frequent anger, and poor immune system. So pyrroles, what's this funny word? Pyrroles is... Another condition, for the most part, it's epigenetic, and it's a chemical imbalance where the body produces abnormal levels of these things called pyrroles. And what pyrroles are is they are a part of the production of hemoglobin. So when we are making red blood cells, we have to be able to make pyrroles, which eventually actually donates iron to hemoglobin. And then once it's donated iron, it tends to have a strong affinity for zinc and B6. For some people, they have an epigenetic imbalance where they cannot get rid of pyrroles. They tend to build up a little bit. And if they build up, they bind up a lot of zinc and a lot of B6. And then they can create a severe deficiency of zinc and B6. And as we know, zinc and B6 are both needed for an array of different neurotransmitters. So these people can have a whole ton of different problems and it creates a lot of oxidative stress. So some of the symptoms you'll see with this, very poor stress control, fearfulness, anxiety, depression, hyperactivity, lots of sensitivity to, to lights and to noises, lots of inner tension, poor muscle development, uh, often morning nausea or a tendency to just not want to eat at all. White spots on the nails, little or no dream recall. That tends to be fairly characteristic for low B6 levels. And a lot of times they will say when people start to remember their dreams again, the B6 levels are starting to come back up a bit. And what's neat is that high stress states can also trigger elevations in pyrrhons. So, um, and I think about this with growth spurts. So when are our two most intense growth spurts that people go through. Terrible twos and teenage years. Yeah. <laughs> you check most of those kids and they're probably going to have a tendency to have slightly more um, elevated pyrroles. And if they already had a susceptibility to it, it's just going to get a little worse during those times. <clears throat> You'll also see delayed growth because it, zinc plays a big role in so many of these things. Um, they have skin problems, so often they have very sensitive skin as well. It might burn easy. They might have other skin conditions like eczema or psoriasis, rashes. 
Um, they can have obsession and negative thoughts, poor wound healing and frequent infections, extreme mood swings. This is the Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde syndrome. Good one moment and then all of a sudden something changes and boom. And usually this, I, I find this often happens when things come out of the blue for people. Um, particularly for, for kids, but for adults too, like change. If you had made plans and then all of a sudden the plans change and the kid has a complete meltdown, I think of this sort of stuff because there's very poor ability to manage stress. Histrionic behavior. It's like the drama queen type of thing or drama king. Uh, tendency to stay up late, extreme irritability, short-term memory problems, and joint aches and pains. Because remember, it creates a lot of oxidative stress, which creates inflammation. So high pyros give you a double whammy because you end up with both zinc and B6 being really low. You get a huge depletion in the production of most of these neurotransmitters. And you get a lot of oxidative stress, which depletes a lot of your other nutrients. If you have lots of oxidative stress, then what happens is our body is using up so many antioxidants. So has anybody heard of antioxidants? Mm -hmm. So we have antioxidants to counteract oxidative stress, or what we call free radicals. If we have a lot of oxidative stress, our body will use up tons of things like vitamin C and selenium and vitamin E and all these different nutrients that we use to try and balance out um, all of these oxidative reactions. But this can be corrected quite fast. I had a patient, the, so when you look at pyrroles, pyrroles optimally should be between 0 to 10. And I saw a kid a while back, a child that's 12, and was diagnosed with ADHD and they wanted to put him on medication. He also had anxiety, very poor stress control, we checked all of his blood levels, and his pyrrole should have been between 0 to 10. He was almost at 100. Worst, double worst one that I had ever seen. And so I just think, oh my gosh, like, I was astounded, and at the same time, like, really excited because it's completely treatable. Like, it can be treated, and it should be able to be corrected as it goes along. They just need to stay on the program. But, I mean, you would see this kid would sometimes... Um, his ability to manage stress was just gone. He'd be under the table sometimes like banging his head or even I think he started to even hurt himself a little bit at times too. He also had a double whammy because he had high pyrroles, significantly low zinc from it, but he also was overmethylated, which adds a whole nother piece of things too. So I mean sometimes you can have multiple pieces to the puzzle. So what are these methylation disorders? So Methylation is basically a carbon with a few hydrogens attached to it. But it's really important because they go on and off different compounds in our body all day long in every cell, literally billion times every second in every cell in every organ of the body. I mean, they're a big deal. They play a big role in regulating how our body works. But what they find is that methylation has a tendency to really dominate certain systems. So it's essential in our ability to detoxify. If we don't have good methylation skills, or uh, if, we don't, if our methylation system is not working accurately, then what's going to happen is we're going to have difficulties detoxifying. As a big role in producing hormones, in inflammation, and energy production. But what we're talking about primarily for here is its ability to regulate the reuptake of neurotransmitters. So remember when I said you either have to make them but you also have to keep them in this bucket, right? So what methylation does is it affects the bucket, okay? So it either puts too many holes in the bucket where the neurotransmitters drain up too fast, or it plugs them up too much so we, we can't get rid of it when we need to and we build it up too much. So methylation epigenetics. Um, methylation status is established very early on. Somewhere between, I think, day 9 to 16 in utero. And so when we test to see methylation status, I don't retest that one to see if it changes. For the most part, if you are over or under methylated, then you're over or under methylated, and it just needs to be managed. And depending, some people might not have as many issues with it at all, depending on environment and all these other things. For some people, it's a bigger issue. 
So you can be undermethylated or overmethylated. I'm not too sure why these pictures show up like that, but um, it doesn't really work out quite like that. <laughs> but I'll explain the difference in personality <laughs> between them. <laughs> Kimmy, come stand by the yeah, no! <laughs> So you look at the global population. 70% of the population is generally considered normally methylated. 22% is undermethylated and about 8% is overmethylated. And that starts to have consequences on how we feel. So like I said, we have to think of this like a bucket. If you're undermethylated, it affects the genes that regulate the production of these things called transporter proteins, which are like holes in the bucket. So you need to make a certain number of holes. But if, you, if that gene gets turned off, which methylation often does, then you can't turn it off and ends up creating too many holes. So an undermethylated person creates too many holes in the bucket or that synapse, and they can't keep enough of that key neurotransmitters like serotonin and dopamine there. So it drains out too fast and it has a dramatic impact on how they feel. And for the most part, they would say that the the epigenetic effect on these transporter proteins is even more important than the production of them. For an overmethylated person, they can't make enough holes in the bucket. So what happens is they can't drain off the neurotransmitter they want, and it ends up building up too high. And then they get a whole different group of symptoms. So when you look at the incidence of undermethylation, 98% of autism spectrum disorder are undermethylated. 95% um, of those with antisocial personality disorder were shown to be undermethylated. 90% is schizoaffective disorder, 85% oppositional affiance, 82% anorexics, and 38% patients that were depressed. For overmethylation, panic and anxiety attacks 64%, paranoid schizophrenia 52%, ADHD 28%, behavior disorders 23%, and depression 18%. So you see sort of a tendency towards different types of symptoms a little bit. So when you look at undermethylation symptoms, when I think about this with kids, because I have an undermethylated 12-year-old, so very strong-willed, have a tendency towards defiant. This is the tendency towards oppositional defiance. These kids are highly competitive um, in sports and games. They might have a bit of a calm demeanor on the outside, but there's a lot of inner tension. Lots of fluidity, so they tend to be, they have a lot of saliva, they can tear lots. Um, lots of controlling behavior, even verge on to say sort of manipulative behavior at times. These patients usually do well with serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So this would be something like Prozac. This would be a group where if they took Prozac, they would probably say, yeah, you know, I actually felt a little bit better on that medication. They might not want to stay on it, and it can be treated with nutrients, but they would be the ones that would actually get a good response from that. In adults, we usually see this group with higher libido as well. For overmethylation, tends towards primarily high anxiety and even panic attacks. Hyperactivity, nervous legs, pacing, lots of sleep disorders. And that's every patient I've seen with overmethylation has a sleep disorder so far. Well, I should say the women I've seen with sleep disorders that are overmethylated. Um, low libido, absence of seasonal allergies, food chemical sensitivities, dry eyes and mouth. They're very empathic, they socialize well. Uh, I remember Dr. Walsh saying, you know, overmethylators were like, they, you, those are the people you wanted to be your neighbor. They're like, the nicest people you'll ever meet. They're usually highly creative, um, non-competitive. They are the ones that do horribly with SSRIs. So when Dr. Walsh looked at, in his book, Nutrient Therapy, he talks about a lot of this stuff, but they looked at a lot of the high school shootings that happened in the States. And what they found that 90% of those high school shootings, that those children were often put on an SSRI prior. And he says that I bet you anything that those children that put on an SSRI for either anxiety or depression were probably the overmethylator groups. Because what happens is they already have far too much serotonin. 
and uh, far too much dopamine. So what happens is when they were put on SSRI, it just raised it. And it can actually put them into almost a bit of a paranoid, delusional, mm -hmm. schizophrenic state is possible. Mm -hmm. And so what they found was that it could even um, increase suicidal and homicidal tendencies. So Dr. Walsh would say that before anybody ever gets put on an SSRI, like an antidepressant, they should be checked for methylation status to see if it actually makes sense or not. What they also were talking about at the course <clears throat> was that the kids that are going to have an adverse reaction to things like vaccines are that are going to be at a higher susceptibility if there is a chance that they were going to react to a vaccine were going to be the undermethylated group because they already have problems with those detoxification pathways. So they are not able to filter it out as well. So what would be really great to see in the future would be that they develop it, they develop early on where they can actually test kids for their methylation status to see because if that child is under methylated, they should be, if they're in their parents are still wanting to vaccinate, they should be put on a very alternate type of a schedule. Um, it should be much longer paced out and much easier on the system so there's less chance of a possible reaction. So advanced nutrient therapy, we look at medical history, we review all the symptoms, we look at key tests to assess for blood and urine levels of things like zinc, copper, pyrroles, their methylation status. We look at the whole big picture, we look at a bunch of symptoms, they fill out a symptom questionnaire because that's a big piece of it too. Sometimes the labs are not always 100%. Um, so you have to be able to take into account symptoms, labs, and then sort of go from there vast majority of time when we were at the conference, you'd see a, the patient would come in and sit down. At the end of it, the patient would leave for a bit. Dr. Walsh would go through and say, okay, how many people think high pyrrols? Raise your hands. How many people think low zinc? How many people think high copper? Overmethylated, undermethylated? Everybody would kind of guess. And about 90% of the time you were right because he has narrowed down the symptoms so well over the 30 to 40 years of seeing it over and over and over again. Once we figure that out, it's a very specific protocol of key nutrient therapy to balance out these imbalances. And then retesting down the road to make sure that they're absorbing it and that it's actually working. And to adjust if needed to. Dr. Carl Pfeiffer, who was one of the founders of orthomolecular nutrition, said for every drug that benefits a patient, there are natural substances that can produce the same effect. And that's where nutrient therapy falls into play. Feel free to contact me if you have any questions. Um, I work right over there most of the time. Um, other than that, I'm downtown a couple days a week too at my clinic down there. But feel free to get a hold of me. And if you're interested in this, I implore you to check out the Walsh Research Institute. Um, it really is, I think, groundbreaking, cutting-edge research on what he has come up with. And he has just really started to do more physician training now to try and get more doctors to be aware of this information. And after I learned about it, I just thought I need to share it because I, I, and since doing it, it's been really remarkable what you start to see. So thank you so much for coming. And um, hopefully we'll see you at the next Community Health Talk. Can I ask, do you do the actual blood work? Do you do the actual blood work? Not anymore. So, so we used to, yeah, everybody, for the blood work I do here, you, particularly for the methylation status, the only lab that does it here is Gamma Dynacare, so you'd have to go to that lab. I can give you a requisition for it. Yeah, right. And, and you would go and get it done. And then you would give the results back to you. And then I get the results. Okay. For pyrrole testing, the only, there's not a lab here, you have to do a, it's a urine test, and it gets, a lab kit gets sent out to you from a lab in the States. You deal directly with them. You do the test kit. You send it back out. Then you would forward your requisition back to me so that I could send it to them because a physician has to... Rec rec um I'm just curious about all that copper and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, for sure. Because I'm diagnosed with, like, I'm in a clinic and they've got... I just went off the pill and they were not working for me. Yeah, I really think the more I've looked at all of this, I think it was beneficial for everybody to get sort of, just to see where's your baseline. Yeah. Um, 
just for everybody, the more you kind of know where your baselines are and your tendencies, <coughs> you can then balance around it. So right? I believe in the nutrient part. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. And the the, um, the methylation test, is that covered by ODIP or is that a patient covered? For the most part, um, I'm, the first part is getting a doctor to write a requisition for these tests because they will have no idea unless they've done this course yeah, what exactly. these tests are checking for right. um, because they're just not trained in, in sort of biochemical nutrition in that way. Mm. Um, I have had some patients where I've requested that they print off some of the information from the Walsh Research Institute, bring it to their doctor, give them the list of some of the key labs to see if they'll run them. Some doctors have been okay. Mm -hmm. And I think the copper zinc ceruloplasmin that I would need to see what's, and then I have to calculate a percent free copper. Mm -hmm. I've seen that run sometimes without a problem. Um, I don't know if the test that we use for methylation status is actually covered by OHIP, even if it's done by a doctor. So the pyrroles, I don't think you would get covered, other than it would be covered through extended health care under naturopathic medicine usually. But most of the time, that one would be out of pocket or through insurance, like extended health care insurance. So I would just print off the information? You'd need to know which labs to test. I don't think Dr. Welsh has that information there because ultimately you'd want to be working with someone who knows what to do with it. Yeah. But I could tell you the labs if you wanted to see if your doctor... The key thing is that even when physicians really want to do good, which the vast majority of physicians, that's their intent, is to do really good work. Mm -hmm. The problem is that also um, sometimes they just aren't aware mm -hmm. of nutrition and what, it, what its powerful role is, so they just discount it if they're not aware of it. And sometimes even those doctors that I work with that do like all of this stuff they have to be careful because they can get their hands slapped by the government if they are running tests. The government now has very specific symptoms that you patients need to present with for you to order a test. And if they do not present with those symptoms, then the doctor should not be ordering that test. And if they start to order too many tests, they start to get in trouble a little bit. So I had a good uh, friend of mine that's a doctor, and she used to run a lot of tests for me. She said it's getting really tight and they specifically don't want to be running naturopathic doctors lab tests because that's a lot of times what's happening now. So it still depends on the doctor and depends on the relationship with the doctor and I think the case. Um, I mean I see some cases where some patients or some kids have been through a lot of stuff and the doctor really wants to help and they're open to it and if you bring them some information they research it then they could legitimately say well I want to see this nothing else has been working let's see based on this. <coughs> yeah. Good. Any other questions? So, Mark's next one. And he has ADHD. What's the, like, what do you do next? Like, he is on um, medication. Yeah. And so, Yeah, so some, some medications, depending, might make the lab slightly off. No, that's Possible. De it, so. so it depends. Most of them would still be, it wouldn't affect the copper zinc ones. It, it wouldn't actually affect much of any of them too much. Okay. It's more some of the ones that, um, the, some of the stronger SSRI meds and whatnot that can throw things off and some of the other psychotic meds. Um, but for the most part, what would happen would be you'd just set up an initial visit and then we'd sit down and go through everything because it's like this is still one part of it. In my mind, it's one of the important pieces to get figured out because if it is there, then it's an easy thing to start to correct shouldn't say easy, but it's, there's a protocol to it, right? And it's generally fairly reproducible. So if there's something, then it makes sense to start to work with it. But there still might be other pieces to be looked at. But yeah, just you'd set up an initial visit, uh, an, an initial integrated med visit. We'd go through everything. I'd give you the requisitions you need. You could either check with your doctor if they would be open to doing it, or I can go through sort of all of those things with you and break down kind of your costs we might sort of look and sort of figure out, depending on what you're able to do, you do all of it or you do pieces of it. Depends. 
and I would send you off with a, or email me ahead of time, and I would send you a uh, brain chemistry questionnaire to fill out so that I can see what comes up from that first. At least, so then I'd have all the information when you come in. So, so are you saying, like, he's on medication, he's on medication for a while, on different ones? And <clears throat> so are you, are you saying that by a certain time you might be able to Sure, that's all possible. I mean, medications are there because they are trying to balance out a dysfunction or a, an imbalance somewhere, right? And sometimes medications can do a good job with that, but long term, they, they often tend to create some other troubles. So what I always look at with it when people are on medications is that I just want to know is there underlying biochemistry stuff that's imbalanced that makes sense as to why they might require medication and why a medication might even make them feel a little bit better. But is there anything else that's going on? Because in my mind, it's like that's still going on. So for example, <clears throat> if say he had pyrroles, for example, right? So then he's getting a very low amount of zinc and B6. He's going to be in a depleted state for that. He might be on a medication that helps to raise his dopamine levels. And maybe that makes him feel a little bit more focused. But he's still got a zinc and B6 deficiency, which is affecting hundreds of other reactions in his body. Mm -hmm. So long... Last, like, you know, yeah. So it's like for, for long term, I think of the, the whole child. Mm -hmm. It's sort of like, you know, there's a lot of downstream problems. You're kind of maybe helping one piece of it, but there's a lot of other stuff that it's affecting. So in my mind, if it can get better by correcting some of those things, then mm -hmm. there's probably not much requirement for the medication, right? Yeah. But like I said, it's, it's figuring out which piece is there and then what else is still going on. A lot of times I still find kids need to do work with self-regulation and some of these yeah. other things too to sort of yeah. build some well, like said, skills. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so he would be a good candidate to see if there's anything else that's there. And then it would be basically narrowing it down to to taking things mm -hmm. and sort of working that out in the best way. So then you would build some sort of like program or something? Like yes. To what Based on what comes start? back, then we target the specific nutrients in the right amounts that he needs. And, and by that you mean like some sort of diet or? Well, diet I would still look at anyways. Like I said, blood sugar regulation and certain key building blocks are necessary. But for this, it's all targeted nutrition. You need to have much higher levels than you will ever get in food. You yeah, need to supplement it with, with, yeah, either in capsules or powder forms or something. Um, you just won't be able to get it from foods. And then from there, when you see like a positive result, then you would do something like a cognitive behavioral therapy? For sure. Yeah. I, I would even probably incorporate it along with it. Sometimes you just have to get things dialed down a little bit first before you can move to the next piece. Mm -hmm. but, um, I don't do cognitive behavioral therapy. I definitely work a lot of stuff around um, self-regulation and some stuff around that and some different ways that I use it, but there would be lots of other resources for that, whether you're looking at uh, counseling that would be focusing on cognitive behavioral therapy or something to do more with self-regulation, but we would discuss all of that at that point too. But I do a lot of that work too with self-regulation because it's really interesting and it's a really important piece of it too. And you can work with them in lots of ways. Like um, something called heart rate variability is a great measurement for your ability to govern your autonomic nervous system. You know, to when you're in fight or flight to retrain what it feels like to be in rest and digest again. So it's training I've done myself to work with it to see. You can, you can reframe experiences because if you're seeing something in a fight or flight place, it always looks the same way. If you can then pair that experience or that sort of stressful thought or whatever, but being in a rest and digest place, all of a sudden you change your relationship with that experience again now. Um, I'll give you an example. With heart rate variability, for example, I would be training to see how often did I come out of a coherent state, which would be a, pair, um, a rest and digest state. So I would have a clip on my ear, I could hear the tone, it would tell me where I was, and I would then wear it when I would be driving. 
And as soon as I'd start to get into traffic, the tone started to kind of change. I'd be going from rest and digest, and I'd gradually be sneaking up into fight or flight. And so then it would be a trigger for me to bring awareness to the fact that my body state is changing, so then I could do a specific breath work that would put me back in that state. The more I did that over and over, eventually I just found I'd get into traffic and it never switched. So I changed my reaction to that event. It's I no longer have the same relationship with it. And this is really important when people have certain stressors or if they've ever had traumas or anything along those lines is it's like, you know, so many times people want to just like get rid of stuff that they don't like and you're not getting rid of it. You want to change your relationship with things. It's still a part of who we are and whatnot, but if you can see it from a different angle, all of a sudden it doesn't trigger the same feelings anymore. That's where I look at things like self-regulation and uh, heart rate variability training. It's a great one to do when you're parenting. So it's like, yeah. check to see, I would wear it sometimes to see when do I, it's like, okay, don't react now, wait until I'm in a state here, as a reminder, don't make a decision until I'm there, because chances are, that's not going to be my best decision, this one will be a lot better. So it's, it, I mean, there, there's so many neat tools to be able to use. I think when people meditate, they should hook themselves up to a monitor like that to get an objective measurement to see if they're getting into the state that we really ultimately want to be able to um, foster. Send them a pay next Saturday and we'll do the Yeah, we'll probably, yeah, it would be fun to do that one time. I know, eh? <clears throat> yeah. It's all about four year olds who are like this is Yeah. So it's very high function. So I don't know what people see, but it's a hard time. You know what the down process is? Where's the green option? So we're going to start at that. It would still be the same things. Um, I generally just like to see all of it because I, yeah, well, which is great, though, too. It's like if you can catch things early and if they're, like, my guess would be, <clears throat> and I don't know because it doesn't always work out like that, but my guess would be he's probably undermethylated, and then that's just a tendency. And so if it's being managed fairly well, you might not see a lot of stuff come up, but if he's treated with it, maybe you see it, it opens up another level of functioning for him that maybe is being cut off right now. Okay. Yeah, and, and this is it because he's so young and where I take it. I mean, that was his therapist that comes to the house. Yeah. I mean, he speaks and he says words that people behind him are like, what? And he does it in the right context. And so he's not just talking rubbish. Yeah. And people are like, where did you learn that word from? Obviously, you heard this somewhere and you remember it. I'm very clever at this. Right? For sure. Yeah. But then I asked him to do something simple. They just looked at me like, wow. Well, so he's like, yeah, I'm going to show the therapist that wants to have it once a week. And you can react a lot. But I'm just trying to find a new focus on where to take him, what to do. Yeah. Um, I mean, he's diet, but I'm a very good diet for my family. But he sort of said the smell and well, he's you're. A lot of things, so like a lot of things. So. You're. You're probably on all the right track. I mean, when you also get into all of this stuff, especially with ADHD and autism and everything, there's a huge part around occupational therapy and speech and language pathologist and hearing. And it's like, there's a lot of other areas where it's like, I mean, it gets into a lot of potential things. What I look at with this is that if there's something like this that's playing into it, it just has a lot of downstream effects. And so if there's key nutrients that play such big roles in a lot of these different um, factors, you just want to make sure that they're, they're all on track. And if there is something, like for example, if he was undermethylated, then he would probably, it would probably support everything a little bit more if that worked a little bit better. Because it's almost like, say, methylation status, it's, it's almost like it ties into a bit of our personality state. So sometimes when people say, well, that's just the way I am around stuff. Well, maybe, but not always. Like, you might be kind of physiologically in that, but it might be because you're not in just the optimal function. So I think of it like you look at undermethylated. Um, for example, some things like obsessive compulsive disorder, competitive. Like a lot of these things that, if you look at the spectrum of it, if, if they're somewhere in the middle, 
that could be really beneficial. That's gonna take you a long ways. If you've got some obsessive compulsive, it's gonna keep you in school. If you're competitive, you're gonna to wanna to get good grades. It could, you know, like they would say, these are usually the Ds, the PhDs, the MDs, the JDs, like all of the people that have gone for a long time to do stuff, because you've gotta have a tendency towards that. But if it's balanced, then that can be really good. But if it's not totally balanced, then it can lean towards like, you can get stuck in obsessive compulsive tendencies. You can become too defiant. So where I look at that is it's like if he's in that realm, you just want to support it, right? And then there's key nutrients you take to make sure that those methylation pathways function optimally. I mean, for a four-year-old, because the spelling is amazing, my seven-year-old asked me, Cooper, how do you spell this? And he spells it for him, and he only sniffed one, you know, yeah. one song, right? And it and it's like um, it could be a piece of it, yeah. right? I don't know even the degree that that's going to where it's going to play out. Well, yeah, there's. Can I just say something quickly? My son's autistic as well. He's almost nine now, and I totally remember when I was in your place, four year old. But the one 